Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Goldcamp. I wanted to take a minute of your time for those of you who are just starting to listen to this podcast series. So if you've listened to part one of me interviewing Dr. Thomas Siegfried and you found some of that rather confusing, my suggestion would be to go back to listen to the preceding, the immediately preceding three podcasts. So I did three prequels, prequel one, two, and three, to an interview with Tom. And I did it for just that reason. The whole vibe, if you will, of this podcast is to bring down the science language, bring down the medical language so we can all understand it. Because it's not beyond our understanding. It just gets rather technical when people get so specialized in a particular way of working and what they're working with. It happens to all of us, whether you're a, a plumber, a doctor, a teacher, you got my point. So um, that would be my suggestion. I think you'll get a lot out of it. And this is basically how I'm going to be introducing speakers in the future, not just as an interview, but I'm actually going to do that interview and then work backwards from that interview to do the prequels, to line it up. So it allows for more people to understand, to get more out of the podcast when that comes to be. And in our future, we'll have uh, Dr. Westman. He's agreed. Dr. Stephen Kunay from Sherbrooke University, a fascinating guy. And I hope to have um, some of the others on there. Just uh, keep on asking. Dom as well, since they're all related and work with each other and know each other. So to that, there's more to come. So go back and listen to the previous three podcasts if you were interested at all in listening to Tom and found it a little technical. You don't have to just bear the technicality and get lost. You can learn a little bit of it, and I paraphrase it and put it in my own words so everybody can understand. Have a good listen. Take care. Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, the ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive in one way it's simple and one way it's a little bit complicated. I'm yeah, yeah. The well, I think I think you have to. There's other biomarkers that you can use. Some people use these cancer blood markers. Like they use imaging. Like, you can do imaging analysis, blood marker analysis, you know, PSA analysis. There's different blood markers that also parallel sometimes. As you start entering to therapeutic ketosis, a lot of these other tumor markers start going down gotcha. in general. There's some people who say it hasn't gone down, but you know, in general, most people start to have a reduction in these in these other biomarkers. Would you say uh, lactose dehydrogenase is it one of them, or it's just one of many? I would have thought that that would have been kind of yeah. Key. I, 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 a lot of people haven't focused on that. Like when we tell our our cancer patients when, before they start, my I don't have any cancer patients. I'm not a physician. I can't treat anybody. But but I tell the, my colleagues that are physicians get the the largest complete blood work you can get on the patient before anything is done to that individual. So we need to look at every, all the electrolytes. We need to look at all the triglycerides, the cholesterol, LDL, HDL. We need to look at every kind of a, a, a blood marker that's possibly available in a clinical chemistry lab that you can possibly look at. Mm -hmm. So just get the full parameter of what this, and you find many of these people um, are already screwed up metabolically. When you look at their blood work before that, before okay. when they were first diagnosed with chem, before you treat them with chemicals or radiation or surgery, um, a lot of them have blood work that's not that's not what we would consider really healthy. Right. Um, not always, not always, but in many cases, their triglycerides are high. You know, their their blood sugars are too high. You know, they right. they have no ketones. You know, it's it's like, and you look at all these different markers together, and you say, okay. And then as you begin to transition them into the into the state of therapeutic ketosis, the blood work, Joe, oh man, the blood work becomes pristine. As a matter of fact, Trudy Dupont. Uh, had her blood work taken a year after starting the ketogenic diet for her brain cancer. And the do, uh, the physician there in Nice, France, looked at her work and she said, I have never seen an LDL. H L her, her, her HDL was um, the same value as her LDL. It was a unit because usually LDL is always higher than HDL. Right, right. So she had a one to one and she had the lowest triglycerides. And this guy says, you got the blood work of a 21 year old and she, and she was 60 years old. And uh, so clearly, if you do this therapeutic 
ketogenic diet right, everything in your body becomes, pre- not everything, but you you become younger. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. There's a big resetting going on that I, I don't know how you measure it because, but you can look at the blood markers, but I think something stays with the person for a while. Oh you know? yeah. We uh, did that with the mice. We actually, we actually did that. Huh. Uh, long-term effects, their whole physiology changed after, after doing this. Right. I have no doubt. They could, they could, they could eat less food and maintain their, their pre- pre-treatment body weight under, with less food. Hmm. So that means their whole physiology was more metabolically efficient. That's interesting. You know, it's hard to extract uh, lessons that you're learning directly, but some of them are everybody should fast, I don't know, once a month, once a quarter or something to, you know, and then track for the, you know, glucose ketone index and get therapeutic and then move on. I think it's a great reset in the very least. Um, I wanted to go back to Orberg because through you, I've become very fascinated. My dad's dad's name was Otto and he came from the German uh, stock and so on, same area. But um, it, the one way I, I look at uh, Otto Warburg, tremendous I mean, family history, you know, his Einstein playing violins and his parents, you know, house and Krebs was one of the students and like, it's a who's who of famous people. Yeah. But, you know, how he didn't connect with the ketogenic diet and yet was so focused on seeing the whole fermentation you say, in essence, I would have said glyco- glycolysis, but it's bigger than that, obviously. But, you know, saying, wait a minute, they're producing lactate, what's going on, and, and recognizing we got a, uh, a mitochondrial problem here. And speak to that, because that was kind of one of your discoveries, too. I mean, you had to go back and kind of resurrect this guy. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but since your book came out in uh, 2004, you know, met, uh, Cancer is a no, Metabolic, t- that tone. No, t- uh, 2012. 12, was it? Yeah. So maybe it was one of your studies because the peak yeah. interest of, I'm pretty sure, I have to recheck what I'm about to say, but I think you're the guy that tipped off the world of Otto Warburg because the, the amount of interest that went up after that was precipitous and it was kind of dormant for four or five decades, three decades. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, he his theory was that cancer arises from um, damage to the respiratory capacity of the cell. Uh, in two steps. Number one, the respiratory system becomes inefficient. And in step two, there's a compensatory, there's a, 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 an energy compen- compensation for the loss of energy through respiration. Right. So it's a two-step uh, process. And um, it's, that, it's that gray zone between going from respiration to fermentation. That's the transition between normalcy and, and malignancy. And then obviously, uh, once, once that happens, he felt it was irreversible. <clears throat> um, you know, I looked very carefully at his, at his data. I, I saw Linda Nebling had treated children with, with uh, brain cancer at Case Western using the concepts of Warburg. Um, and I began to think more carefully because I had seen these same kinds of phenomenon in the calorie restriction when we saw glucose go down and ketones go up. Warburg never knew or discussed the ketone issue. He was he was primarily focused on the underlying cause of the cancer, which he had steadfastly uh, believed that was damage to the respiration. Um, and I think that's what got him in trouble. We, we now have a paper that will be coming out in ASN Neuro to show that Warburg was absolutely 100 percent correct. Mm-hmm. We're showing now for the very first time that there there's two forms of fermentation. Uh, he only knew one form. Um, and that was the big the gap in not understanding that the mitochondria can also ferment was the missing link in Warburg's theory. So, uh, in fact, our paper is discussing the uh, reevaluation of Warburg's theory in light of our new finding, which is basically that you can ferment amino acids um, in the mitochondria. And Warburg knew nothing about this. As a matter of fact, the, the almost the entire cancer field, as we speak at this moment knows nothing about this. So this is not something that, you know, oh, everybody knows about. Right. Um, they just, in fact, my colleague, uh, Krista, uh, uh, Dr. Shernopoulos from Semmelweis University in Hungary is astonished because he's a, a big uh, mitochondria energy guy. And he was astonished to find that almost no one in the cancer field discusses my, uh, mitochondrial fermentation, uh, which is a substrate level phosphorylation mechanism inside in, in the TCA cycle. So you can't respire, but you can certainly blow out tremendous amounts of ATP from a fermentation metabolism. So Warburg knew nothing about this. And because some of the enzymes responsible for that were discovered um, and and looked at more carefully after he died. Okay. 
So, and the early papers that came out were not well recognized or discussed. So he was unaware. There's nothing in his writings that we could find that showed uh, how amino acids could be could be fermented. Got it. Got and it. Um, can I paraphrase uh, for a second, Tom? Yeah. It's like so. What were so what he had discovered? Um, and I think it was his measurement of uh, oxygen consumption versus lactate production as opposed to CO two. Right. So uh, yeah. Well, actually, he also showed that many cancer cells can take in tr- uh, oxygen uh, equal to that of normal cells, but it wasn't linked to ATP formation. The Got oxygen it. consumption was not linked to the formation of ATP because the cells were fermenting. They were making lactic acid. Right. So essentially, you know, the Pasteur effect says uh, from Louis Pasteur that, you know, uh, yeast cells ferment in the absence of oxygen. And as soon as oxygen comes into the environment, they stop fermenting and they start respiring. Right. So you can see respiration is associated with, a, with an elimination of lactic acid in a yeast cell with normal re- respiratory capacity. Right. Well, the cancer cell, he, Warburg grew cancer cells in pure oxygen, not 20%, but 100% oxygen. And the cells are still fermenting. So clearly he argued that there must be something wrong with their respiration because there's no way in hell that they should be making lactic acid and 100% oxygen. Right. Right. So he then found this was a, a characteristic of almost all kinds of cancers that he studied. And he came to the conclusion, and the Corys, who, who received the Nobel Prize for the Cory cycle, mm-hmm. were able to show in living chickens that had tumors that they, that they were, they were uh, sucking in tremendous amounts of glucose and blowing out tremendous amounts of lactic acid in a living tumor system, directly supporting what Warburg had been finding in his, in his slices of tumors. Right. So, so it, it, the problem is, is the field um, thought uh, Warburg had clearly shown that the that phenomenon, which is the continued production of lactic acid in the presence of oxygen, which has now become called the Warburg effect, right. was the effect of damage to the respiration. So the when mole- when the molecular biologists got a hold of the problem, um, they just completely gummed up the whole damn thing, looking at all the genes. And then they concluded that it was the genes that were controlling the Warburg effect, not the not the mitochondria, because the mitochondria were taking in rec- oxygen. And they were looking at at meth, and they were saying, "Yeah, the mitochondria are taking up oxygen and making ATP, which looks like they have normal respiration." Right. But then you give them cyanide, and they still do the same thing. <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> There's no way in hell, and they do it under hypoxic environments too. Right. There's no way in hell they can have normal o- oxidative phosphorylation. Right. So Christos and I, I originally thought the idea, and I had some little plan in my book, Chapter 8, but then I got linked up with Christos, who's the world leader on that, in, on that reaction in the, in, the, in the world. He's the, he's the guy who's focused his career on that one reaction. And he wasn't really thinking about cancer when he was studying that, that enzymatic reaction. Mm-hmm. So I told him to start looking at these tumor cells. He was blown away. So my God, these, these tumor cells are all, are all fermenting. <laughs> They're mitochondria, mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation which is the same mechanism that the, that's used in glycolysis. I mean, it's a substrate-level phosphorylation rather than oxidative phosphorylation. Right. So the difference is, and that, that was all new to me, and I find that really fascinating, is that so now you have mitochondria that, that either it's damaged, it has its defects, so it can't use or doesn't use oxygen for the most part, but it actually can take in glutamine to make it glutamate, and yeah. and then you measure that by its end product of succinate. Is that how we're doing well, it? Su- yeah, succinic acid, and that was another key um, observation uh, that was made by Hosh Kochka, who since has passed away from cancer, if you can believe it. He had his lab in Hawaii, and he was he wrote some really interesting uh, papers on on, on um, animal physiology under different environmental conditions. And he published a paper in 1975 uh, describing amino acid fermentation in in aquatic animals that were held underwater. Um, you can, again, you can't do these experiments. <laughs> You're today. right. But um, he took seals and uh, dolphins and um, some sort of turtle and, uh, and, and put them on a board and strapped them to a board and held them underwater. Now, he, these are animals that actually can hold their breath for a long period of time. He wasn't taking some guy's dog or cat and holding it on. That's what they did at the University of Illinois in the, in years ago. I, I was there when they did all that stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can't do any of that stuff anymore. But those are fundamental uh, st- studies in physiology for sure. But, uh, but uh, what Ko- Hokoschka measured in, in, in seals and dolphins that were held and the turtle, when you hold them underwater, he would take their blood and measure the metabolites in their blood. And the two predominant metabolites was, were, were uh, lactic acid and succinic acid. So, um, well, succinic acid should never uh, 
be dumped into the in, into the bloodstream or anywhere because it should be fully oxidized in the in, in the in, in the in the TCA cycle. It shouldn't be dumped. So uh, the end product of mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation is succinic acid. And now we know that succinic acid is an inhibitor of HIF-1 alpha, which allows the cells to ferment. <laughs> so, um, you know, the whole thing is all the parts of the puzzle are coming together now. Absolutely. And Otto Warburg was absolutely correct in his, in his general theory that respiration damage was the origin of cancer. Um, but we had a lag of almost 100 years thinking that the Warburg effect was something other than what Warburg said it was. 100 years. And now our new, when our new paper comes out, which should be in a couple of weeks or a month, uh, it's already accepted. It's in the proofreading stage now. Um, we, we shine light uh, on this process. And I think now we've, we've, we've connected the, 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 the dots. We have found the missing link in Warburg's central theory. Uh, of cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease, mm -hmm. and um, you combine that with the with the findings that reactive oxygen species in these damaged mitochondria cause uh, genomic instability and mutations, and now you begin to realize that the entire the majority of the cancer entire field is on a bedrock of sand. It's misdirected. So, um, and that's and uh, and that's I think one of the the the, the major reasons. For the what we have today is the cancer crisis, right. which is 1,600 people a day are dying from cancer from a, a fundamental misunderstanding in the nature of what the disease actually is. And I hear you. And so I want to tease that out a little bit. What you're saying is, for those who think that cancer is a genetic, primary genetically caused because you were born with a mutation or you acquired a mutation by some exposure, um, it's not necessarily that. It's basically the mitochondria are not genetically damaged, but they do have defects, and it's in their defects that stops the respiration, which is the mitochondria processing the oxygen, and that's it. And is that primary defect the cardiolipin of the... It's, it's uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know that, but we have not yet found a tumor that has normal composition of cardiolipin. Okay. So, so and, and the issue, of course, is uh, you're, you're absolutely right. You get, you, people think, well, this person inherited BRCA1, and now she's at, uh, right. her gene is causing cancer. Um, it will cause cancer only if she also sustains damage to her respiration. Mm -hmm. um, if, she, if, that, if she carries that gene and the gene, for whatever reason, doesn't, doesn't damage the respiration, then she never gets cancer. So we call that in, in, the, in the field of genetics, we call that penetrance. So is, is the gene 100% penetrant? And if, the, if, a can, if any cancer gene can be found, that's 100% penetrant, then that, then that mutation would be the cause of the disease. Right. But we have no gene that has ever been found in cancer that is 100% penetrant. And nowhere but, near that, and nowhere near 100%, right? It's very- Yeah, well, the closest one is the leaf round many uh, syndrome, which is the P50, inherited mutation in the P53 gene, which is about 82 or 3% penetrant. Pretty high. It means yep. that about 18% of the people that have that exact mutation never develop cancer. So, um, but everybody who develops cancer, who has a P53 mutation, has defective respiration because the P53 gene encodes for cytochrome C oxidase mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. which controls, which is a, a respiratory issue. So, so what if the cell is to survive? It must upregulate uh, fermentation. Okay. So you damage the respiration and a knee-jerk reaction, which is the secondary part, which Werberg said, there's two parts. One, whatever damages the respiration, then must be a transition period to a fermentation metabolism. And once the cell enters a fermentation metabolism, it goes back to its default state, which is proliferation, because what's regulating the growth of the cell and the maintenance of the homeostasis is the mitochondria, which no longer works, so the cell falls back. And the cell behaves as if it were using the metabolism that existed on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere. So these cells are falling back on an ancient program right. that existed. And during that period of time, which was the alpha period, according to Albert uh, St. Georgi, who won the Nobel Prize for his vitamin C work, mm -hmm. he said everything fermented in those days and everything was rapidly proliferating and it would proliferate until the nutrients in the environment dissipated and then the uh, cells would die. So metabolic therapy for cancer is doing nothing more than depriving the, the cells of their fermentable uh, fuels and killing them. Right. So we're just bringing all the all the, the concepts of biology and evolution and genetics back into its rightful place when it comes to understanding cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease. Uh, absolutely. Um, speaking of evolution, did you uh, pick up your press pulse um, uh, template? We'll say from your evolutionary friends. I mean, yeah, you're saying one's yeah, a chronic well, stress. Understanding Darwinian evolution 
as much as people talk about it, uh, very few people really understand it. Okay. And, you know, Darwinian evolution is nothing more than, than trying to um, ascribe, you know, the organization of biologic, biological creatures on the planet. People get all upset sometimes and think it's challenging their religion. No, no, people should never think about that. The concept of evolution is just, is just a, an explanation of how organisms formed. It has, shouldn't do challenge anyone's religion at all. Um, but a lot of people uh, uh, forget about evolutionary concepts and introduce teleological uh, viewpoints. Mm -hmm. You know, cancer cells like have a mild of the, mind of their own. They're, they have an agenda. You know, they have this, they have that. They don't have any of that. <laughs> you know, this is nonsense. And you find some of the top research papers in the field using teleological arguments to describe the phenomenon of a disease. No wonder we have 1,600 people a day dying. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incomprehensible. Yeah. And it's, such a, it's so explainable. The crisis that we have in cancer today is clearly... It, it, the, the reason for it is so clear in my mind and we will not get out of this rut until people can finally understand what the nature of the disease is that we are dealing with. And then once people, the, the, the major institutions come to realize what, what's going on here, I think then we're going to see major advances and improvements in the care of these patients. I have no doubt because I've done all the reading, your reading for the most part, but, uh, being older now, I'm a little more cynical of corporate interests and uh, political maneuverings. I mean, was that on the tip of your tongue in terms of why we're stuck where we are? Well, yeah, I think it, well, it's a very difficult problem. It's not just um, uh, that, you know, we, we've had these, uh, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, you know, do no harm, right. which has been stretched to its furthest imagination. <sighs> Uh, and then, and then we have this the, the prayer of um, uh, Myonides or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you know this. And if you read the prayer very carefully, it should it, it says in the physician's prayer that you know cor um, finances and profit should never ever be considered part of a of a healing process. Um, and well, obviously that's been uh, thrown aside as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the educational process. I mean, these physicians are, by and large, for the most part, are, are entering a field for the, the good to help people. I think that's the motivation for the majority of people, not everyone, good. but if, I think the majority of people, okay. they want to do good. They want to do good. So you, you go to a, a, an educational institution that's going to train you to be a, a, a physician, and you learn the basics. But then when it comes to cancer, you learn all of these toxic ways to treat the disease. You don't learn about the concept that this is a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And then, the, well, the argument is there, well, we can't train the physicians to do that um, until we see big clinical trials. I says, what about the basic research that supports the concept that's been massively established by tens of thousands of researchers mm -hmm. indirectly? not even understanding what they're doing, but when you reinterpret their data in light of the new information, it all, it all comes down to that. So obviously, if a clinical trial were to be done the correct way, I think you're going to get astonishing results. And the problem is, how can we do that in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where um, we have to treat people with toxic approaches as part of the as part of the treatments. So when I discuss this with my friends at the top medical schools, they say, "Well, we can't do the groups you'd like us to do. We can we can do the standard of care, which which is being done all over the right. place, and we can do the standard of care with some metabolic approach, but we can't do the metabolic approach without the standard of care, and that's the missing control group. That's the key control group. Because what happens if the patients in that group do better than the other two groups? Clearly. And what, and what if that particular standard of care had to do with radiation, which basically blows everything out? It gives, it gives, yeah, I, th I think, I think you, you have to, um, uh, why are we, why are we treating patients with so many cancer patients with radiation? I'm not saying we get, we dump radiation completely because I think there's certain kinds of tumors where radiation might be the only way to really manage that disease. Okay. And brain cancer is not one of them. Uh, brain cancer, radiate, people who have brain tumors should never be irradiated, ever. Okay, I can say that right now, and I have evidence to support what I'm okay, saying. Okay, and that's and we'll just add, but that's because it releases a lot of glutamine, and the and the cancer cells yeah. suck up the glutamine, and they're they're the yes, the, that's the yes. fermentation. In other words, you, okay. you you sign the death certificate as soon as you start irradiating. Right. Now, for the, for for ninety ninety eight or ninety nine percent of the patients, that's what you're doing. You're signing their death certificate by just putting them into a radiation mode, because it's very hard for the brain to recover. Uh, and some of these people can die from radi the, the radiation toxicity, uh, radiation necrotic damage right. 
uh, as well as the temperature. So you're putting these patients at massive risk by, by irradiating. And then on top of that, they'll probably put them on steroids or they'll bring up the sugar. Yeah. So now you're back I to mean, the two fuels that will feed the cancer. Yeah, it's just un- it's just tragic. It's beyond tragedy. Uh, it's it's heartbreaking. You know, it's just when you know what the biology of the problem is, and then you see people doing these other kinds of things that are putting all these poor people at 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 at, at tremendous risk for survival. You just you just feel terrible about mm-hmm. it, and it's and it's almost like, well, anyway. But I but the radiation. So the, the reason they're radiating is because you want to stop proliferation. The, and in fact, the reason you use ke- chemo, toxic chemo, is because you want to stop proliferation. Bottom line, why are the cells proliferating? Well, because they have a gene mutation that's causing their cell cycle to be dysregulated and therefore they're proliferating. So, so the argument is, is that, well, they can't proliferate without energy because nothing can live without energy. So when you say to yourself, why, what are they using to proliferate? They're using fermentable fuels. Well, if we take away the fermentable fuels, can we stop their proliferation? Yes, we can stop their proliferation and we can kill yeah. them. So why would you need radiation and chemicals to do the same thing that metabolic therapy would do without the toxic effects? Well, we can't use your metabolic therapy because we haven't had a clinical trial. But if you have a few functional brain cells, you should be able to read the literature <laughs> and understand the concepts. So <laughs> you, you yep, know? I hear you. I hear you a lot. I, I, hate, I hate to put it in such a crude way. You have to. But, but, the, but the problem is we got 1,600 people a day dying. It's a crisis. I agree. It's a crisis. So from my perspective, you're having some successes, and it seems like you're having some great collaboration overseas. So you have in Turkey, and you had yep. uh, the case in Egypt. The one in Turkey yeah. went really well until she decided not to do it. And You know, it's hard. Um, I'm not going to say that this is a panacea, because we're learning that um, we have a lot of learning to do. Uh, we're just at the beginning, at, at the very beginning of this new, of this new uh, uh, approach, to managing cancer. And we are in the, in fact, stumbling a little bit. Um, you know, everybody has a different physiology. Everybody has different levels of motivation and, and support and systems in place. And, you know, we have to control for a lot of different things right. in order to get people. The physicians have to be on board with knowing the concepts the, the patient needs to know the concepts, the family needs to know the concepts. What might be very effective in this person may be not as effective in another person. So we have to tr- tweak the 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 metabolic um, uh, the ketotic the, the, the ketotic state. Some people can enter ketosis very quickly. Other people can't. Right. How do we deal with these people when the patient is finally in therapeutic ketosis? What is the dosage, timing, and scheduling of the drugs that we will now use to treat the disease once the patient is in therapeutic ketosis? So if the patient is not completely in therapeutic ketosis, will the drugs be less effective? effective, what doses should we use, what the timing, the scheduling, all of this stuff has to be worked out. So this is the new era, the new era. But it's, it's, if you're a physician, then this should be the golden era of your, of your profession. Right. Because for the first time, you're actually going to be managing a person's disease with, with a knowledge, with a variety of approaches that will, uh, so you're going to be, the physician should be the master of knowing his patient and knowing what therapy and in, in which timing and doses and skeleton will work best on this guy and another guy he can choose. This is going to be magnificent. W- rather than sitting this poor poor soul down in some chair and infusing him with some toxic chemical and you walk, the guy walking away, coming back, you know, and mm-hmm. administering some sort of a drug to prevent him from vomiting, you know, uh, uh, th- that's not what I call medical practice. You know, it, medical practice is when you finally can take the knowledge of the metabolism of the person and kill a disease uh, in that person with, with a combination of drugs and diets and, and other procedures, hyperbaric oxygen yep. to replace yep. radiation. Yep. So we, we can do it. I think that, so that's the future. The future in my mind for cancer is very bright. Um, right, because uh, right now it's uh, it's it's we're in darkness. Yeah. Uh, we're in a state of darkness. The number of dead people piles up every single year. You know, every now and then you get a little blip in the curve, but basically it's always uh, it's always increasing, and it's increasing throughout the world. It's not just the United States. No, I hear you. I hear you. So 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 obviously, if we had something that was truly effective, um, we would have a drop. In, in the number of dead people. Mm-hmm. And you can you can evaluate cancer deaths, uh, uh, age adjusted, all that crap. The, I, I look at bodies, the body count. Mm-hmm. You count, just like right. in Vietnam, right. you wanna know how, you, you count bodies, right? Yeah. We, we, we thought we would win the war counting bodies, but apparently we didn't do that nope. either. So, so um, but, uh, but you wanna kill, you wanna kill the tumor cells before it kills the patients. And you wanna do it in a non-toxic, cost-effective way. 
So the other emerging toxic effect is this financial toxicity, yeah. which which is in my mind immoral. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, if 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 you see a, a a person, human nature says if you see someone suffering or in, in, in stress and distress, you you generally do something to help that guy. Right. If he's in a house that's burning, you run in and grab his ass and you bring it right. out. Right. You don't say I'm I'm not going to take you out until you give me fifty thousand right. dollars. Do you see that <laughs> primarily as a as a uh, an American problem? I mean, having no, I see it as a world problem. Okay. Uh, um, I, I, it's just that we've exa- exacerbated that problem to, an, to a, a, a very immoral state. Yep. But it's, it happens everywhere. And, you know, who's going to afford these immunotherapies? And uh, you can't afford these right. things. They're not going to be they're not going to be available for the general public, you know. And why immunotherapies are, are also based on the gene theory. Mm-hmm. So, you know, t- mutations in the tumor make our T cells ineffective in killing the tumor cells. Mm-hmm. So we're going to give you CAR T immunotherapy, or we're going to give you one of these uh, other kinds of immunotherapies. And many patients suffer immensely from these things. Yeah. You know, it can, some of these things are causing the tumors to grow faster, causing people to have diabetes, causing all these other, you shouldn't treat anyone with the remote possibility that you can make their disease worse. Right. Right. right? right. Why are you doing this? Right. Why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a simple question. Why are you treating people with therapies that could make their disease worse or in any way harm them? <laughs> so it sounds like you're saying, by the way, the weakest link in why we're not thinking, we now collectively in the United States, I'll say, is because our med schools have not gone on, either developed their biochemistry, either, I mean, I know you said, hey, well, there's not enough studies out there, but I think that that education, has, you're saying that education has to be at that level so you get the early doc, in at least in their mind, as opposed to... Who knows if we get advanced training? That's not bad, but it would be greater, if, better if it was in medical school, at least. Oh, I, I think so, because, well, you know, it's a, it's a biological disease. Okay, we're cutting people, we're irradiating people, you know, we're giving them toxic drugs. Every one, every one, of, these, every one of these treatments poses a medical risk to the patient. Right. So, therefore, the individual is put into the medical establishment only because the treatments have made them vulnerable to things that they would have not had had they been not treated for cancer. Right. So if you're if you're doing any kind of a surgical procedure on somebody, that's a medical a medical process. So, you know, our view on me- on metabolic therapy is once you use a non-invasive di- not a diagnostic test, a lot of people can be diagnosed with cancer without having to cut or poke right. them. Um, and say, listen, you've got some sort of a mass, you've got some sort of a lesion that shows up pretty clear. Um, now we would like to put you under a, um, a three-month uh, metabolic uh, therapy, okay? And we'll monitor this in, in two months or a month, or one, every month, and see what's happening. And generally, the ma- large majority of people will see a significant reduce, reduction in mm-hmm. that mass, if not a complete elimination. Mm-hmm. Okay, if the mass is not completely eliminated, uh, in a three-month metabolic approach, then we could define it ba- bo- ba- uh, borders much more clearly than we could before. Now that person becomes a candidate for a surgical procedure where we can debulk or remove the mass, and the mass is now well-defined. And there we th- then we think we can cure the disease because surgery, if done correctly, can cure many cancers. Okay. The, prob- the problem is if the, if the tumor cells escape into the bloodstream, Surgery now becomes uh, a, a, a non, it doesn't work. It won't cure the disease because the tumor cells have escaped. So then you use chemicals, and we don't have to use chemical. We would use metabolic therapies that would target glucose and glutamine to track down and kill those other tumor cells. Gotcha. Gotcha. So again, again, this the strategy to to manage cancer will be under a, a very different. Uh, uh, right. paradigm than what's currently being done. In talking to you, I think back about, uh, let's say, the time of Wilder or Peterman, the whole idea of the innovation of the ketogenic diet. And I don't mean to make this about the ketogenic diet, but at the Mayo Clinic, you know, they had huge kitchens. I mean, their whole getting yeah, the yeah. the meals together. Yeah. So all of this was, there was a lot of work behind all that. And, yeah. you know, that's not what we hear anymore. I mean, you're obviously part of that. I mean, we're doing this now, but there's been a big gap. You know, what happened to those called medical kitchens? You know, they were. Yeah. Well, well at, at UPenn, they have one because um, Christina Berkovic, uh, who's a friend of mine, works at, at CHOP, the children's center there. And they put up a keto kitchen to train the parents nice. how to how to manage the, ch- the seizures in the children, knowing how to cook the right foods, the proportions that they give them and all yep. these kinds of things. And those keto kitchens for epilepsy are opening up all over the right. place. OK, well, you can do the same thing for cancer. I mean, cancer can be managed in the same strategy. Uh, the future will be clinics. 
um, like you say, the, tre the Cancer Treatment Centers of America are basically, they're very similar to Dana-Farber and MD Anderson. They're, they're doing basically the same thing under a different name. Mm -hmm. They bring in they bring in some nutritionists and say it's different or something. <laughs> very, very, right, it's I very agree. insignificant. Yep. It's, they're still, using, you know, they're still yep. using the same toxic therapies. Yep. So the new concept will be a center where people go and they are treated for cancer as a metabolic disease. Mm -hmm. So they would be trained with the keto kitchens. They would be, they would be admitted. They would have physicians that would administer the correct drugs that would target specifically glucose and glutamine. Okay. And they would be cocktails of these kinds of drugs. Right. They would be hyperbaric oxygen. There would be these, maybe, perhaps the ozone. I haven't tested that yet, but there's a lot of, there's so many new ways that we can manage this disease using a metabolic approach, which would significantly reduce harm to the patient or to the rest of the body and, and contribute to the overall uh, improved quality of, uh, of health. And we saw that in the patient that we had in Egypt, where he was a metabolic mess when he was first uh, diagnosed with glioblastoma. And as we began to treat him, his blood work improved. A lot of the parameters of his, of his state improved while we were treating his, his brain tumor. Mm -hmm. So we, we were, you know, the problem with that was, which was outrageous is they still had to irradiate this poor fellow, despite the fact that his tumor was under control by metabolic therapy. And we think he died because they did a pathological uh, evaluation of the brain tissue a month before he died. And most of the damage was from radiation necrosis damage oh. rather than the tumor. Oh. So the, the attending physician was outraged about this whole thing. And you also have to keep these people under, under uh, evaluation for at least, uh, uh, at least six or eight months, I think. I mean, you can't let them you know, re go out, outside of your care. Right. Um, because they get off the they get off the metabolic therapy, they're not taking hyperbaric oxygen. They they start falling apart on what's needed to maintain the, the 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 pressure on the tumor. So again, this is why I'm saying it's a learning. We're at a learning curve here, and we're going to have to have an army of physicians that are going to have to uh, um, think about this and take their skills and what they know and apply it to the problem. And I think there's so many physicians out there that know a lot about the biology, about the physiology mm. of the body. It's just that that knowledge is being misdirected. It's not. It's not being. It's not. It's not being mined. It's. It's not being used to its full potential. And I think so many of these physicians could be doing so much more to help these patients if if they treated them as as the disease as a metabolic disease rather than as a genetic disease. I hear you. I hear you. It seems like the bright yeah. spots now are well, certainly Turkey. You mentioned Egypt, Hungary as well, for sure. And yeah. well, is it because it's going to happen in the United States too? I, there there are there are people that that I'm speaking to who are outraged by this whole and system. And let's take a step up. And they want they want they want to start something. Okay. And then the groups of doctors are getting together, functional docs, functional medicine docs. And, and I think they're forming groups um, to challenge uh, the AMA standard of care uh, for cancer okay. because the standard of care, if you look at it, has been a failure. Um, and the failure becomes from the, the fact that we have 1,600 people a day dying from the disease. Right. Um, for, for them to argue that we, our standards of care have also cured uh, thousands, tens of thousands, if not millions of cancer people, people who have had cancer, um, you know, I'm not saying they haven't, but those people, many of those people, most of those people have paid a serious price for their cure. Right. They now have all these other maladies that they never had, but for the fact that they survived the treatments that they were that they were used to treat the disease. So we have new branches of medicine opening called cancer survivor medicine, which now treats patients for emotional disturbances, di uh, hormonal imbalances, neuropsychiatric, uh, hormonal, all kinds of things because they were tr treated with all these toxic uh, approaches. Right. This is nonsense. We shouldn't have to do this. Okay. People should emerge from cancer therapy healthier than when they, than when they, before they started it. Absolutely. Not worse. No, I, my cancer is gone, but now, now I have all these hormonal imbalances. I have depression. I have yeah. all these other things. You. you know, this is nuts. This is crazy. Let me, so, uh, let me be a little tedious you know, here because in the components of the metabolic therapy, you know, how we start that. I just think, I, I think it's wonderful and I, I love listening to it. I mean, so we start off with uh, basically getting them on a ketogenic diet and they get their glucose low enough, their ketones high enough, so then we can add insulin to get their uh, glucose down, perhaps even lower. Well, the insulin have to be careful. Yep. You got to make sure the person is insulin sensitive. Right. 
um, we have to be careful because I, we have some genetic backgrounds where there's insulin insensitivity, and sometimes that that may not. That's where again the physician's right. eye, knowledge of the patient needs to come in. So everybody has to be. You have to look at their physiology right. before you start doing. Insulin may be good for some, but not others. You know, I, I, on that issue of the whole insulin sensitivity or and or resistance, you're right. It is a it is a spectrum, but I think it's an adjustable spectrum that it yes. it, it, it translates into more time at that stage before they get to go to the next stage. You know, I, yes. Um, we know what protects the tumor cells uh, from a lot of the, the therapies, and that's their p- powerful fermentation metabolism. Right. And that, pre- that protects them against radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and all these other things. So, you know, to get a patient into therapeutic ketosis is taking away a, a part of their, um, uh, their antioxidant capability as well through the pentose phosphate pathway. So we know that. And they also use glutamine as part of the glut to make glutathione. So, um, cause glutamate is one of the amino acids in glutathione and that's coming from glutamine. So clearly if you target the glucose and the glutamine, you put those tumor cells at massive risk for death. So, uh, and today there's no one, uh, at least I know of, uh, other than the, what the guy we treated in Egypt was the first appro- attempt, I think in the clinical situation, I could be wrong, but, um, where we actually designed a therapy that would, could possibly target glucose and glutamine. The problem is we were using drugs that were very weak uh, glutamine target, like EGCG, the green tea right, extract, right. Um, chloroquine, uh, that, that targets diaphoresis uh, to some extent inside the TCA cycle. But these are, are not as strong glutamine inhibitors as, as what I think could be, could be used, like the, the, uh, the drug Don, right. six days. So the problem is it's very hard to get the Don. It's, it's, it used to be used. It's not used anymore for cancer patients. You'd have to have probably some real justification. But we found that, you know, the toxicity of that drug can be significantly reduced when combined with a ketogenic diet. Mm-hmm. So I think we're going to reduce toxicity significantly when you use a therapeutic ketosis as part of the, ther- uh, as part of the program. Absolutely. The woman in uh, Turkey who actually did get, uh, I would say, a, a clear bill of health and then... Uh, for whatever reason, decided to discontinue on her own. And it turned, yeah. you guys didn't do, or it was not included in uh, no glutamine inhibition there. I mean, that was her. No. Yeah, we didn't hit that. Um, and as I said, I think, yeah, the therapeutic ketosis will do a good job at the very beginning and hold the tumor in check. But I think in time, you're going to be killing a lot of these glutamine, uh, glucose dependent cells. And, and some of the cells are going to start using more and more glutamine. So when they say cancer cells are always so tough, it's because you're not taking away their fermentable right, fuels. Right. So they only appear tough. Like, oh, I threw the kitchen sink and this tumor comes back. Right. Um, well, it's coming back because it has an available fuel source. Right. You know, so I, I don't think it's going to come back, uh, if at all, if you combine, if you take away its, its capability of, of, of using fuel. Yep. Now, if there's, if there's a tumor cell that has some level of respiration, um, um, that's still intact, then, then it's possible that that tumor cell could be reeducated to enter back into the society of cells because it's, it, it didn't go through this arbitrary threshold of, of um, irreversibility. Right. As Warburg would say, yeah, there, there's a point when the genome of the, tu- of the tumor cell is so shot to hell um, that there's no way you can, you can re- uh, re- uh, restructure that cell to become part, um, uh, to recover its, its normal function. Yeah. So those cells will ultimately have to be killed. Uh, but some of the cells that still have some modicum of respiratory capacity, they may be uh, rescued yeah. and could return to the society of cells. And now we're learning, it's strangely enough, there's so many things, um, you know, they talk about all these oncogenes and, and driver mutations. Right. Uh, there's a group over in, I think it's England, where they're finding all these tremendous driver mutations in normal cells, right? So um, it just goes to show you that all these so-called cancer uh, d- genes that are supposedly driving are now being found in all these normal cells that has no cancer. Like skin no- and so on and so forth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. And esophagus. Yeah, esophagus, esophagus too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, amazing. So, um, so where does metformin come into that? I mean, I know it's 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 an old drug, glucophage, and so on and so forth. Is that? I mean, my interpretation is, and I is it a uh, glucagon inhibitor, so we can control the blood, or is it something else? I mean, I, and and then I, I hear, well, it has some sort of anti-cancer property, and I have no handle yeah. on it. No, it, you know, we tried metformin. I think it's probably okay. Uh, Trudy was using it. Um, you know, I don't think it it uh, it hurt her. Um, it's not something that's going to hurt you. Uh, it could have some minor therapeutic effect, huh. 
It's not going to be, it's not going to be the big dog. Okay. You know, you're taking metformin. It's not going to resolve your cancer cells okay. for the majority of people, but it's certainly not going to provoke the tumor cells to grow. So, you know, like an immunotherapy could potentially make your cancer grow twice as fast. Right. Well, metformin is not going to do right, that. Right, right. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing you can right. know. Um, but whether, whether it's going to now as part of a cocktail with other drugs that also target these other pathways that are all responsible for the fermentation, you know, it, it might have some synergistic interaction okay. with another drug and therefore metformin's uh, a therapeutic benefit could be potentially enhanced to some degree, right. but that's going to take a, a lot of trial and error kinds of experiments. Um, to look at that under the under the right I hear you. combination. I hear you. And then, and then that, but I don't, I, when people say about to me, metformin, yeah, I'm, go ahead, take some metformin. You know, I, I don't feel that it's going to hurt you and I don't think it's ever going to make your tumor grow faster. Gotcha. So, so uh, that's why, I, that's my position on that. Got it. Um, I think it was one of those studies you told me to read that you, um, oxaloacetate, you have used oxaloacetate. Was that basically to help with the glutamine in terms of, I mean, I can, I sort of, I'm not clear where it is, but I think it helps uh, limit the uh, glutamine, galenoglutamate. Is that it? Right. Well, it could in in an indirect roundabout way. Okay. And as a matter of fact, the, the, the mechanism by which oxaloacetate may contribute to the management of cancer um, is also going to be a long drawn out process because it's not one of these direct effects on, no. on fermentation. Okay. It's an indirect way of doing this. And, you know, people thought it might've worked by a calorie res- mechanism of calorie restriction right. or possibly targeting a little glutamine, but it's, 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 it, you know, it could always, it may eventually be part of a cocktail like metformin. Um, it, it's not clear. Okay. Uh, we got some therapy positive benefit from it a little bit, but as you can see, the animals still die. Right. Right. This was a mouse so, study. So, Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't something that was as dramatic as say Don. No. Um, or combinations of this. We're working to develop here at BC the, the, the best cocktail uh, a combination that will be used with potentially hyperbaric oxygen and metabolic uh, uh, therapeutic ketosis, and then see if we can possibly uh, resolve uh, some of these very malignant cancers in mice. Um, and it's no easy task. If anybody tells you it's easy to cure cancer in mice, they're not using the right cancer. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, so if we can achieve that in the mouse, then I think we'll go right to the clinic and I think we're going to get the big effects right there. Okay. Okay. I, in one of the studies, uh, it was actually Miriam that sent me this um, to give me the layout and uh, dig up some questions that you would use exogenous ketones sort of to help with the ketone levels. Is that something you still look to help or is like, it wasn't that big? Of- well, I do- I, I, yeah, I, I think it, that's another thing that, that could potentially be helpful. Um, you know, the, the key thing is keeping your, ele- keeping your blood ketones elevated consistently mm-hmm. and keeping your blood sugars low consistently. Okay. Uh, exogenous ketones may be able to do that. Okay. So uh, the question is, there's a lot of different kinds of exogenous ketones. Clearly. And uh, I would think that uh, we would need clinical trials or trials on normal people without any disease um, to just go ahead and say, okay, let me, let me, let's see how this product works with the GKI. Right. So we would need, you know, someone doing a, a run of a test for about a couple of weeks on people um, that may, may want to do uh, therapeutic ketosis using various uh, products. Right. And then by that time, you put it in consumer reports and say, hey, this is the product that works best. <laughs> you know? have, well, along that line of thinking of trying to get the ketones up, have you guys looked into not just MCTs, but C8 specifically? You know, I know that's yeah. not a new idea, but I t- oh, talked to uh, Stephen Kinane about that too. And I, yes, you know, I, yeah, 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 no, no, it could be very effective. I mean, as you build these uh, so-called um, therapeutic ketosis uh, uh, platforms, you know, what, what are the different types of fats? What are the different types of proteins and carbohydrates that are all going to be part of this new, of this new thing? Yeah. This is where the food industry comes yeah. in. So the food industry is very interested in this. So, um, you know, they want to build products that if you have cancer, this take, try this, you know, <laughs> ra- 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 rather than taking some drug that's going to, that's going to control your vomiting while you're being poisoned by something else, right? Take, you know, take it, take this product, you know, but, but I can't support, uh, or, or say anything about that because I haven't tested any I, of that stuff. I agree. So I don't want to make a claim about this product being better than the other product because I, I don't know. People have to try it for themselves. That's right. 
and see if you know if, if you're if people are out there wanting to get into therapeutic ketosis and you have a product that will get you in there with 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 less with with less grief <laughs> or struggle <laughs> then by by all means do it absolutely <laughs> but yeah you're saying you're open to that variable you know if there's something that can help us with that side absolutely do it and we'll figure yeah, out yeah. and it varies per person yes yes That's- as I said this is an emerging field. I don't want people to feel that, you know, we have the solution to cancer at hand right now. It's going to be an emerging field and in and, and time we'll be able to, to say we did. That's true. I wanted to, uh, and I've got, it's only because I've read so much that I, I feel like I have this ongoing conversation with you, but um, on the press pulse, the idea of intermittently supplying an acute stressor, and that's the glutamine inhibition, that it's important to know that you know, because I think some people are going to hear this and say, well, I got my two things down. I'm going to stop the fermentation and stop the glutamine and stop the glucose and I am good. No, you'll kill yourself. And yeah. uh, or and it won't be a fun way to go. And, and and the reason that we're doing intermittent for the for the glutamine is because the body also needs it. You know, where it's it's a yes. it's a dicey Absolutely. You you have, now this again is where the physician's knowledge must be must be applied. Because, you know, in burn patients, you give massive doses of glutamine because the immune system to kill bacteria where well, your skin protects you from all these, all these bugs and they'll come in and they'll kill you quicker than anything. Sepsis and all these kinds of things will kill you quick. So the immune system needs to be uh, at its highest when you have burn. And the glutamine is a powerful fuel uh, for the cells of our immune system. So if you are too aggressive in targeting glutamine, you paralyze the very cells that you're going to need to pick up the corpses. So if I have a, a, a battlefield and I've got a lot of dead corpses on the battlefield and I don't pick them up, you run your risk of causing some sort of a systemic infection. Right. So, so you need to have a, 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 an immune system that's going to be at the ready. So if you go and be too aggressive on targeting glutamine, you affect the gut, you affect the, um, the uric acid cycle, you affect the ability of your macrophages, T cells and B cells all to function appropriately. So, so that's why you have to pulse that right. and you can't, you can't press it. And I mean, we're even thinking about giving a glutamine inhibitors together with high dose glutamine. So in this way, you'll just target the tumor cells while, in, while keeping the rest of the immune system healthy. So again, uh, this is a, a concept that we're working or thinking about right now. So, um, cause the cancer cells really need the glutamine. Right. Okay. But if I have a drug that blocks it, and again, it comes down to dosage, timing, and scheduling. Yeah, yeah. What, when do you do this? Right. Do you do it simultaneously before or after the, 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 tar, the drug targeting? Right. So again, uh, but I think these are problems that are solvable. Um, solvable. Yeah. That rather than chasing 100 million genes right. uh, that you have no idea what they're doing. Right. So, so uh, these are very solvable uh, problems that people should be very excited about. Right. Right. So the the idea of giving the the glutamine inhibitor in the glutamine, you're blocking some, and then you're allowing some. So you're not killing the body. Yeah. Well, for, first of all, if you have the patient under therapeutic ketosis, yeah. Yeah. They, they're not going to be growing very fast anyway. Right. The tumor cells. Right. So um, if I if if I rescue a few cells with a, some extra glutamine, but I'm ki- if I'm killing fifty percent of your population population and rescuing twenty five percent, you're still on the advantage of killing them. Mm. Mm. So, so you just keep doing that until the population is annihilated. Right. You know, basically. So it's it's a uh, 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 downgrade the population. It goes up by a slight degree. Okay. Downgrade by a bigger degree. Up by a slight degree. So it's a it's a stair step effect of yep. eliminating the tumor right. cells rather than trying to kill them all at once. Right. And running into tumor lysis syndrome, which has been a case of some of the immunotherapies, you know, um, you got you got to be careful about people running in and wanting these immunotherapies and then dying from the damn immunotherapy due to tumor lysis right. syndrome. They just overwhelm the system, right? The tumor lysis yeah. syndrome. Wow, excellent. Boy, Tom, you're one of the most exciting people I get to talk to, you know, and you just like burn bright. I've seen you present five times, and I don't know if you know this, but everybody holds their breath or stop breathing about halfway through your presentations because they don't want to miss the next sentence, you know, because you're like so full. You don't turn around and take a break, <laughs> you know? No, you know, the, well, you have a lot of information to distribute in a very short period of time. No. Yeah. And, you, and, and, you know, we teach classes at the, at the university level, and we know that we've got to get everything into a 50-minute block. Otherwise, the eyes fall, the heads fall, and the kids just, you know, they lose, they lose focus. Yep, yep. So, and again, if you have a lot of information, a 50-minute block, you know, it's like in my cancer, I have a class on cancer that I teach the whole semester. So, we go through every one of these points yep. in massive, in incredibly detail. massive detail. Wow. 
right down to the experiments that people are doing in different papers. And then in my cancer big biology class, where we have 150 students, um, I have three major lectures. And these kids are not biology majors. They're, they're historians and economists and uh, statisticians and these kinds of people. You know, so this, they, they're very attentive, actually. So is, is, and, are uh, these cancer lectures for like non-science majors? Uh, yes. In a sense that you're, you're now getting the bigger picture to people who need a little more general terms or whatever? Okay. Yeah. So you got to be able to to communicate these ideas to a, a, a population of people that yeah. that don't that never heard of this That's stuff right. before. So, and I give lectures to the physicians too, right? Wow. So they're they're no different than the kids, right? None of, none of these people have ever heard any of this stuff before. Um, but then the the advanced biology students they 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 will read the, um, um, the 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 direct scientific research papers and your book that are published. Right. Yeah, I'm not I'm not expecting the uh, the undergraduates in the big non-science classes, you know, to be reading about P53 mechanisms of action. They, they just, they just have to know the general concepts and how it all, how it all put, you put it all together. So it's a different audience there. So given your excitement in the metabolic therapy concept and the students you're teaching, they must be pretty excited. At least I look back, if I had a teacher like this in college, who would sort of set your course about what you expect to do, whether it's going into medicine or going to research. Have you got that sort of response? I mean, that you're, you're- Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. A lot of these students that are not science majors right. uh, become, a few of them, of course, become super motivated to want to do something. Right. right. Um, uh, so whether it's raising funds for metabolic research or whether it's, I had one student who was an economist um, who got so angry and upset about this current situation. He said, what can I do? So I put him on financial toxicity. <laughs> yeah, he's an economist, right? <laughs> So <laughs> he wrote a paper that's under, it's actually under review in a major journal um, on the, on the origin of cancer, of fin- uh, 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 the origin of financial toxicity in cancer. And he and the, the pro- professors in the economics department were blown away by the, the, the unscrupulous behavior of these drug industries and, and what they're doing and how they're, they're, they're taking drugs that were found to have a little bit of benefit for cancer and the drug was $5 a gram and they're making it now $10,000 a milligram yeah. when they find out this is immoral. Yeah. <laughs> this, these, these companies are immoral. I mean, what else can you call it? Yeah. What else can you, there's no other definition. I agree. I agree. So, so, uh, it, so it's, and you know, you tell these, well, we're trying to help people. No, you're not. You're, you're Scarelliing these three, you know, Martin Scarelli. Yep. I tell you the guy who made the EpiPen, I mean, the drug companies do the same thing. It's, it's just they don't boast they're about doing it. With ins- really- they're doing it with insulin right now, actually. The cost yeah, of insulin has gone up by a lot. So why are they doing that? To make money, right? right, right. It's like I'm saying, you, I'm going to charge you $50,000 to bring you out of the burning house. Yeah. I agree. I mean, it's just it's just terrible. I, absolutely. I mean, it's just, no, no moral conscience on these people. Well, what sounds exciting, though, Tom, is you you now have your colony of people at the university, <laughs> at the college, and that are really, I mean, that's excellent. I mean, it's nice to have people appreciate what you say, and you know, and you have a lot of that. Well, it's it's, it's it goes mostly outside of the university because you know you're in a biology department where they're studying zebrafish, yeah. yeast cells, right. and things like this. So uh, they're not doing cancer research like we do. Yep. You remind me, however, of uh, George Cahill. I, I I would love to have known him, but anyway, um, he ended up uh, moving up to you know he moved up to uh, Peterborough, New Hampshire, and he would go and he would teach a course yeah. for non science uh, majors and professionals at Dartmouth that it became yeah. the most uh, popular course. And they would come to listen to George Cahill talk about. Oh yeah. Well, the best thing is when you have Cahill, when you had Cahill and Veach uh, together in the same room, that'd be- Oh, those guys were unbelievable. So, but fortunately, Bud is still going strong down at NIH, but you know, Cahill and I would sit for hours talking about all these, what they used to do to these patients down there at the Diabe- Johnson diabetes center I cannot- and how they learned about all this stuff. But you're right. He his speaking style, and he was a very soft spoken. But the words came out so powerful, um, and the way they he was able to interpret all these all these things. I think, unfortunately, he passed away yep. uh, a few years ago. He had double. I remember when he was getting his his knees replaced. Um, he had two both knee replacements, and I put a damper on his mobility. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you know, fortunately, I was around to have him in the early 2000s here at Boston College and. And talk to him about all these different That's things. It's very exciting. It reminds me of what I've heard about Warburg. Is like, wait, so he had Krebs as a, as a colleague or a student in his lab. He had, yeah. um, oh, he was in contact with Einstein, who uh, obviously 
it did things and inter- got him out of the war. And uh, the contacts that he had and the education of batting these ideas around, which must have been very exciting. Yeah, I think it is. And, and you know, when you're entering into a field, the best thing to do, a good thing to do is always um, at least discuss your ideas w- w- with people that that have a very um, a, a deep understanding of the issues. Yeah. Um, and if they understand the nuances of these issues, uh, they can correct you uh, if you're if you're off off the mainstream. Right. So um, Christos Shinopoulos in 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 Hungary is the leader in the field of of mitochondrial metabolic uh, fermentation, right? Met- mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation. Uh, Richard Veach is the, one of the leaders in the world of on ketosis and yep. ketone. He was Hans Krebs's last student. Uh, these guys are uh, these guys are in the bioenergetics, biochemistry field that have they've spent their whole life in this field. Um, so so when you get to the deeper levels of things, it's good to have people there that um, can keep the boat yes. uh, on the right track, r- rather than than making claims, uh, absurd claims uh, that have that have caused massive numbers of t- people to become confused. Mm-hmm. There, there are a lot of heavy, so-called heavyweights in the cancer field that have published many papers that have misunderstood uh, some of the fundamental issues. And only because these individuals have such a powerful presence, they cause other people to think like they, they are yeah. simply to get their papers and their grants funded. I agree. But yet they, they contribute to the confusion that's already existing in the field. And is that more true than not with molecular biologists as opposed to biochemists? I mean, that there seems to be a propensity of defining things through molecular biology and less. Yeah. About- well, genes can't do anything if they don't have energy. Yeah, you're right. So, so it's everything is energy. Yeah. So it comes down to the, the genes are facilitators. Right. right. They facilitate the ability of a cell to ferment. Right. But they are the effects, not the cause. If I right. take away the ability, the genes turn off. Why? If I don't need to ferment, why am I keeping these oncogenes on? And that's been proven. You move new mitochondria to the cytoplasm, the oncogenes turn off. That is amazing. That, absolutely. <laughs> so once you understand the key issues, then the, all of this stuff becomes a lot, a lot more explainable and understood. Excellent. Tom, I'm going to let you go now. And I, I, I so appreciate the fact that you've been, uh, you know, through, uh, through Miriam primarily, it, it time to talk. I find it very exciting. Um, I'd love to touch back with you as we follow up with some studies another time if you yeah. ever fit me in six months down the road, because I know it's, it's an evolution. I know it's changing a lot. And uh, it's just so exciting to, to hear this. It just seems so just outside of immediately applicable. You know, these pieces are coming together. Yeah, well, we need people um, that are going to be in the trenches that start to apply this to the patient population. No doubt. Because ultimately, that's the, that's the final frontier. Yep. I mean, if you have a therapy that can reduce the death rate by 50%, and, it, and it's doing that, then it, obviously the concepts are correct, right. Right? right? I mean, so, and, and yet we're not doing that. Um, and, that and that's the tragedy I, as I see it right now. So people like yourself and others that have potentially the possibility of moving this field forward, you know, the ball's going to be put in your court at some point because yeah. we can only go so far. You know? I agree. I agree. Well, it speaks to the collaboration because I, you know, I, I, speaking of being in the trenches, the problem about being in the trenches is that you're with your patients, you know, well over eight hours a day and you're tired five days yeah. a week. It's, you're lucky yeah. if you can come to a conference, yeah. an yeah. extra article is, so it goes on and on. I know, I know, you know, it's very hard, but, but it, it's, it has to happen because, because too many people are dying no, and I suffering agree. needlessly. So it, somebody has to take a break in what they do and I say, okay, I got to retrain. I got to relearn. And it's at so many levels because it's not just, you knowing that all the concepts and knowing how to apply that, can you do it legally? Yeah. Can you do it without being losing your license? No, I agree. Um, right. So this is a lot of things that need to change. Right. No, that's so, exactly, exactly where I'm at. Uh, I wanted to pivot back to you by saying, um, so people can help fund your efforts by, I believe it's uh, one cause one cancer. Well, it's, um, it's the, the, the foundation for uh, uh, metabolic therapies. Okay. That's, that's Travis Christofferson's foundation. Okay. He wrote the book, Tripping Over the Truth. Absolutely. Yeah. And he set up a foundation to support uh, metabolic uh, approaches to cancer. Okay. So he, and, funds, he funds our work. Okay. So, and so it's also, independent. Yeah. And Boston College, um, w- you can fund my work, but it has to be very specifically defined. So if, if people, like if, if, 
if, if people want to make a substantial gift to the research, right. they have to specifically define that it has to go here. Uh, otherwise, it gets distributed to other programs. So, um, um, and it, 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 small like mom and pop guys, if they want to give me twenty five or thirty dollars or ten dollars, which they do, right. um, you know, it's better to give Travis's organization that kind of money Got because it. because we have a standing uh, research collaboration or grant through that foundation, um, and and you know ninety ninety five percent of all the money that goes to Travis's foundation goes directly into the research nice so which is very different from any other organization any other foundation that's out mm. there as far as i know um the university you know takes very little of it through private foundations yeah uh, and you can do the same thing if a grant if a gift came in at ten thousand or, or fifty thousand dollars to the university yes the university can support but it has to be very specifically defined and stated that way Okay. Okay. So, so best to go through Travis's great guy, by the way, isn't it nice that he discovered you, you guys, because you have a relationship in essence, you know, he's Travis is a good guy and he is, 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 is absolutely on the right track of trying. He's doing it from a different angle. He, he's doing it from bringing the, the, the knowledge that cancer is a metabolic disease to the masses. Yeah. Um, and I think the whole thing is going to happen from the grassroots, from the bottom, great. Uh, the, because the patients want this. Um, they hear about it. They want, why can't I be treated with metabolic therapy? And you go to Dana-Farber, MD Anderson, or, or uh, Sloan Kettering, and you don't hear any of this. Yeah. So what's wrong with this? I mean, who are these guys at Sloan Kettering that think they know what they're talking about when they have all their patients, so many of their patients being maimed and die from the, their treatments? Right. You know, it shouldn't happen that way. Yeah. So the patients should, and they're getting organized too. So um, it's just a matter of organization. And as George, you said, is a tipping point that comes and everybody's going to want this. So, but it, you know, we have to, we have to walk on the hot rocks for a while. Before yeah, we no, I to. think so. I don't know if you know this, but they're working on a standard of care for um, reversing diabetes via the, you yeah, know, kind yeah. of through uh, the Verda Health, not entirely, yeah. but it's fascinating that a number of, you know, a document's been made yeah. and for a number of people to approve, docs to approve it. But I think the same thing, another avenue towards metabolic therapies could be something similar as well. Oh, so, absolutely. But you're going to have to break through the massive power of the, of the industry, you know, which, know. Is, which is not a small industry. You're talking to a naturopath. We know about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, naturopaths have been on the, on the, on the cutting edge of the metabolic approach because they, they do a little bit more. They do a little bit more than some of the, the MDs do. I agree. We're yeah. also at the place where most of the baseball bats get thrown. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, everybody's got to deal with their own issues. Yeah, I get it. I agree. <laughs> anyway, to that. Thank you very much, Tom. Okay. So appreciate it. We'll okay, be... Carl. N Take nice care. talking to you now. You bet. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and I thought I would take a moment to address a number of questions before the next podcast gets prepared. And that is, people have asked a lot about a coaching program that we have started and are uh, building on. So this is a call for the next go round of the coaching program. And I thought I would go over some of the things that are going to be included in this particular coaching intensive, as some people have come to call it. What we'll be talking about are, are some of the basic things that everybody needs to know, calculating your macros, logging in your foods, you know, knowing what foods to use. Um, also, how to use your ketometer or how to measure ketones, whether it's uh, breath or urine. Uh, your ketometer and your uh, glucometer, of course. And what's the difference and why would you use any of these? So those are basic things that need to go over. Um, we'll go over labs, general recommended labs, so you can follow yourself and know, you know, what things will change when you're in ketosis, uh, what things will probably dramatically improve. We'll talk about insulin's role, insulin resistance, so you really have that understanding down diagrammatically and certainly in your own mind. It really applies to everybody. We'll talk about stress and its effect on uh, your own blood sugar and therefore what are some of the consequences. It's a actually big deal. Most people are unaware of that actually. We'll talk about various kinds of diet, keto versus zero carb or what has now come to be known as carnivore. We'll do a fasting trial collectively as a group uh, from one to seven days. I'll probably try a seven days. And most people, if they haven't fasted before, they'll probably do a day or two, maybe three, but to understand, you know, how to do it, to be supported while you're doing it. We'll also talk about dairy, 
And speaking of fasts, we'll do a dairy fast at a different portion, different part of the two-month program. So you get to be dairy-free for a couple of weeks. Not that you have to be, but to experience what it's like to be dairy-free. And then you know. Then you have the experience. It's not a with or without. It's knowing what the difference is. So in addition to this, or the way the group goes is we have a special Facebook group and there will be a maximum of 10 people in, so it's not a very large group. We have weekly meetings on Zoom, so it's like a Skype format where we check in with each other, primarily me to you all, and I cover one of the points in addition to um, everybody checking in. We will all log our foods into a thing called a chronometer, and we'll use that as a background of, of seeing how we're doing. And um, so in this Facebook group that will be combined with the previous group, Every so often we'll have special topics, maybe advanced labs to go over or advanced use of supplements and the uh, biochemistry or uh, physiology of exercise relative to blood sugar in ketosis. And we can go on from there. I'd like to get into cancer a little bit so people have an understanding. We hear it's a cure-all. I think you need to know more about it before you can come up with a statement like that. And an in-depth look at fasting. And what changes. So these are some of the ideas we're doing. Separate Facebook group, weekly meetings, accountability. Ideally, it'd be nice if we have a buddy system, but we'll see how that goes. That's pretty much a group determined uh, decision. So if you are interested, and a lot of people have sent me emails and uh, PMs if they're in the Facebook group, uh, please send me your, your email saying, yes, I'm interested in the group. And what I will do is send you an application and also send you a list of what I consider are important requirements to participate. What I've learned from the first group was that I'm really just looking for people who are willing to take action and to get involved. It doesn't mean they have to be dedicated. This isn't, you know, superimposing some sort of right and wrong. This is basically going through this together as opposed to somebody who just wants to listen to the information um, and never use it. I'm, I'm trying to not have those people Uh, but to have the people that are willing to make a change because it is a transition. I certainly believe everybody needs some support to know what is expected and not expected um, of the transition into ketosis. And what are some of the long-term benefits that I've seen and uh, what you can expect? So if you're interested, feel free to email me at Dr. Goldcamp. So it's D-R-G-O-L-D-K-A-M-P at ketonaturopath.com. And if you're in the Facebook group, you certainly know how to PM me. Okay? Take care, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions, and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy, week after week.